Welcome to the Green Urbanist, a podcast for urbanists fighting climate change. I'm Ross. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. First episode of 2022. Happy New Year to you all. Um, if you're new to the podcast, you're very welcome. You can basically jump in and start with whatever episode you like, but you might find it helpful to go back and listen to some older episodes. Today's episode is uh, with a really interesting guest and about a really important topic. Today's guest is Dr. Morgan Phillips. He is the UK co-director of the Glacier Trust, a UK charity that enables remote mountain communities in Nepal to adapt to climate change. And he's head of insight at Global Action Plan. He has a PhD in environmental education and is the author of Great Adaptations, a new book about climate adaptation. In this episode, we are talking, unsurprisingly, about climate adaptation. What is it, why we need to be talking about it, and lots of examples of good and bad adaptations from cities um, around the world to things like increasing heat. Um, Also, uh, we talk about rural communities in Nepal, uh, which are adapting using techniques like agroforestry. Really, really interesting. Morgan also tells me about two concepts, uh, one called deep adaptation and the other transformational adaptation, um, which explore how we may adapt to something as catastrophic as a society level collapse, which may occur due to climate change. It may sound far-fetched, but in fact there are people who are very concerned about this happening and, and what that would mean. And Morgan sets out some ideas for how we might Um, adapt to something like that and somehow continue to survive in some other way Um, so we really cover climate adaptation from like the micro to the macro scales in this episode including talking about urban design Uh, if you're enjoying this if you're enjoying the green urbanist podcast um, two ways you can help out leave a five-star review you can now do that on spotify as well if you've updated your app um, and also on apple podcasts Um, And you can also just share it with a friend or share it on social media. Um, If you're enjoying this episode, I'm sure you have a colleague or a friend who will enjoy it as well. And that's really the best way for the podcast to grow is just through word of mouth. You can follow Morgan, uh, the Glacier Trust and Global Action Plan as well if you follow the links in the episode description. So without further ado, thank you very much for listening. Enjoy my conversation with Dr. Morgan. Thank you, Morgan, for joining me on the Green Urbanist podcast. Ah, oh, thanks, Ross. It's great to be with you. Um, tell us, yeah, if we could just begin, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Yeah, so I'm uh, yeah Morgan Phillips. I'm the co-director of the Glacier Trust, which is a small climate change adaptation charity um, focusing on enabling adaptation in Nepal, in the mountain communities of Nepal. Um, I'm also head of insight at Global Action Plan, which is um, an environmental char- charity that um, is working to um, help people to live lives um, f- thriving, enjoyable, fulfilling lives sort of within the uh, limits of what's possible um, in terms of the amount of resources the earth has in its carrying capacity. So, um, so yeah, I have those two roles. And previous to that, um, I worked as head of eco schools um, at Keep Britain Tidy um, for three years, um, did a little bit of work um, for Brunel University on climate change politics and um, yeah, have a PhD in environmental education. That's it's very interesting that you, you're coming at it from. Is do you think of yourself as an educator or a policy person, or what's your sort of angle? <laughs> yeah, it's tricky. I think I do lots of different things. Um, I didn't want to carry on in after doing a PhD for three or four years. I didn't. I knew I didn't want to carry on in academia straight off the bat. Right, <laughs> I was too, too young, and I didn't really like all the politics of it and the kind of narrowness of it. Um, so I guess I kind of worked to. Um, enable others to to do projects which either yeah, support adaptation efforts or to, to support environmental education efforts so I'm, so I'm kind of heavily involved in the strategy work of global action plan around our education and around our sort of in schools education but also more broadly our informal education as well so I've kind of um, 
yeah, exist a little bit in the background and um, do some some educating myself when I get the opportunity, um, which I love doing when I when I can do it. Um, but it tends to be these days through things like through things like podcast interviews, yeah. and, <laughs> and bits and bobs like that, and articles and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, it's a variety. Um, so I first heard about you and I got in contact with you through your book, um, which came out recently, which is called Grace Adaptations, um, which is really good. I really recommend that to anyone who's listening. Um, it's a pretty like concise, small book, and it's a great introduction to the whole concept of, of, uh, climate adaptation. Um, so I suppose that's kind of the main topic I'd like us to, to sort of get into today. So yeah, can you just maybe just give us like an introduction? I think it's a, as you say in your book, it's something we don't talk about enough and maybe people don't really know what it means. So can you just give us like an intro? What what do you mean by climate adaptation? So yeah, the book is kind of a result of um, me having worked on adaptation now since 2016 when I joined the Glacier Trust initially. And it was the first time I probably, properly engaged with it and it made me realise how few people, or how few people in the environmental movement are really kind of comfortable talking about it or even engaging with it at all it's it's not a topic that comes up very often it probably comes up at global action plan a fair bit more than other places because i probably bang on about it to my colleagues but it's um, <laughs> it's not a topic which is particularly well known about and, and thought about which i think is is you know has um changes for, for several reasons but in terms of what it is um there's um Lisa Shipper from Oxford Uni has a really good way of describing it. It just sort of talks about how in, in Bangladesh, if a farmer um, who was a chicken farmer, um, recognising that his land is or her land is getting flooded um, more and more often, um, their adaptation is to to switch to being a duck farmer because ducks can swim. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's kind of um, quite a That's nice great. way of describing it. It's, it's sort of how do we how do we adapt our lifestyles are kind of work life um to the changes that are happening because of climate change and, and some of those adaptations are really really small um it might be you know just that we increase the factor of sunscreen that we use from from 15 to 30 because we recognize that it, we're being more exposed to the sun um or it might be far more fundamental, like thinking about the drainage system of an entire city and how can we mm. how can we ensure that the, the city can cope with the sort of deluges of rain that we tend to be getting now instead of the kind of steady rain that we used to get. So it's mm. it's a huge variety of kind of things that we do to adapt to what's going on in the physical world. But there's also I don't really talk about this in the book, but and I don't think we'll probably get into it too much now. But there's there's also this. Uh, the adaptation to the kind of what we know about climate change as well. So mm. I adapt my lifestyle and my in my behaviours based on what I've learned about climate change and what I know will help to mitigate climate change. So, yeah. you know, changing diet or changing the mode of transport, that's that's kind of an adaptation to what we know about climate change. But really I'm talking about the, the kind of adaptations to the physical changes that are happening in the world. Yeah, I think there's a couple of, things that spring to mind for me is that in in my sort of world as you know urban design urban planning architecture we tend to talk more about resilience rather than adaptation which i think has a lot of shared concepts within it is this idea that um we know you know if we think about the we can predict the effects of climate change and we need to sort of do some stuff in our cities to make sure we're resilient to that and that might mean adaptation measures like um Diff- you know, different sort of architectural solutions or green infrastructure and things like that. Um, but I suppose it's it, it also what strikes me is that I think in my profession, we would probably jump immediately to thinking about physical interventions. Like, yeah. as you said, things like drainage networks, things like flood, de- flood barriers, um, flood defenses. But adaptation mm-hmm. sort of covers that wider range of things like um, changes to behavior um and also like changes to our expectations in response yeah, to climate sure. change you know like something yeah. that i'm thinking a lot about now coming out of covid is like god i really don't want to get be taking five flights a year going on like little <laughs> mini breaks like that just <laughs> seems you know something i would have done in years past but it just seems absurd now um is like just getting flights to go somewhere for a weekend um and i think that's sort of a little like lifestyle adaptation where you know, you start to, your, your baseline of what's normal sort of shifts. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, that's true. And I think you know, within those kind of, within that sort of resilience and adaptation, I think there's so much crossover and I think people use 
the terms are quite interchangeably often as well. Um, sort of, yeah, you can build resilience to the impacts of climate change that are coming, which is kind of always feels a bit more defensive to me. Mm. Um, whereas adaptation can be actually about sort of saying, well, you know, think, I mean, in agriculture, for example, you know, the, the, you could actually, you could kind of try and defend the plant that you always <laughs> um, grew by putting up extra shading or like having uv lights or whatever to, to actually keep growing that one plant or you could say okay the climate's changed let's just grow a different plant on this plot of land and that's that's kind of yeah. i'd see as the kind of a difference between between the two um and i think that's probably true in lots of urban settings as well it's kind of can we you know is it is it about defending things from the ever kind of increasing impacts of climate change, especially if you think about coastal cities, it's like yeah. keep building higher uh, flood defences to keep yeah. the sea out, or is it a case of you know actually we need to we need to retreat, <laughs> and that's the mm. adaptation that needs to happen in this, in this area, which isn't about resilience really. It's about it's about letting go and relinquishing something, um, and and kind of you know, using sort of migration as as an adaptation strategy. So there's I guess there's there's, there's the kind of differences as I see them, but it's not something actually I've given enough thought to, and I should probably think more about kind of what the nuances are between adaptation and resilience, because I think they are slightly, slightly different things. Yeah. I th- yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think, um, as you said, there's, there's already ways that we are, I suppose human beings have always adapted where we have a, I think as a species, a great spirit of adaptation in terms of moving out throughout the world and, and making a life for ourselves in lots of different environments. Um, but I think it's it's interesting. It's sort of ironic that your book is called Great Adaptations because it begins by looking at um, malapt- maladaptations, which are kind of bad examples or people people doing it in ways that are actually damaging to the environment, which I found really interesting. Can can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So I mean, the the kind of definition of maladaptation is when in adapting to um, so if if you're vulnerable to climate change and you make an adaptation you might end up passing on that vulnerability and making somebody else more vulnerable sort of downstream. Mm. So if you think about flooding as another, is it like river flooding is a great example of that, where a city could kind of save itself from the increasing numbers of flash floods that it's getting by channelizing the river and putting, putting sort of concrete walls around it and making sure the river can flow straight through the city without causing any trouble. Mm. But then it might just create a huge wave of water slightly further downstream and destroy all of the farmland and villages which are downstream which don't have the capacity so it's that's kind of a maladaptation because they're kind of thinking quite self-interestedly about yeah, well, yeah. we'll protect ourselves from from climate change and we won't sort of worry about the consequences further downstream and that's that's a kind of this that's also obviously a metaphor as well so one of the <laughs> ones i talk about in the book is um in doha in um in qatar capital of qatar there obviously an extremely hot part of the world anyway mm. but getting hotter um and having more extremes of heat and one of the ways that they're adapting to climate change there is by installing air conditioning you know not just inside buildings but outside buildings as well so they have kind of seating areas outside cafes which have fans like blowing cold air out to keep oh, yeah. keep people cool and so that people can be out so and apparently across all like in like whole shopping areas are like this i've never been to any of those cities apart from to transfer through them to get to to get to nepal but um <laughs> it's yeah it really surprised me and obviously then you know that's that's an adaptation which is helping to kind of keep outdoor living possible in in mm. that environment when outdoor living is a nice thing to do and like we all want those things um, and it's no different to kind of us having patio heaters in the UK to keep yeah. us warm in, in the kind of autumn and spring when we when we eat outdoors, which obviously has been happening loads because of COVID. Um, but you know they they're burning fossil fuels to um, yeah. to do that, and same as we're burning fossil fuels for patio heaters, and that is creating more climate change. So in a, in adapting to climate change, you're creating more climate change in a kind of vicious cycle, which will obviously you know have negative impacts for people who aren't in a position to kind of defend themselves from from heat like that and don't have the luxury of air conditioning to keep themselves cool so it's um so yeah that's that's another kind of maladaptation that that sort of sort of obviously happened and then then you have other examples of it which which are different again which is where people just just because of lack of resources or because of um, lack of knowledge or training that the adaptation strategies they're adopting might work for two or three years but then they haven't factored in something which can kind of come come along and kind of knock it down completely and, mm-hmm. and that will have a um 
know, that's then a maladaptation because they've sunk all this money into, into uh, what they right. thought was going to be a solution. Then the money's gone. They haven't, it actually hasn't, hasn't worked. And so an example from Nepal where we work is that, um, you know, there's insect pests are coming into more and more areas that they didn't used to go into because of, because of climate change and, and destroying crops. And so farmers, the kind of instinctive thing that they're doing and what's available to them and what the market is, is giving them as a solution is to spray, spray their crops with loads of chemicals to, you know, chemical pesticides to try and keep those insects away, which works and they grow and they grow the vegetables. Um, but those insects then go off and destroy somebody else, somebody else's crops or have a, like an impact then on, and obviously, you know, pesticides, they get into people's hands through their skin yeah. and cause cancers and have an effect on wildlife and all this stuff. So that's, that's another sort of maladaptation that happens as well. So in response to that, it's, you know, in the work that we do is, is to support those farmers to think, actually stop, think about it. We don't, you know, you don't necessarily have to use a chemical pesticide. There are organic bio pesticides that, that you can use, which mm. are maybe a little bit harder work, but really just as effective. And there's multiple other benefits in terms of health and, and um, wildlife biodiversity impacts as well. So there's, there's that side of it as well. So um, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of a spectrum between being maladap- maladaptive and being sort of effective in your adaptation. It's like you never mm. no no, no. I mean, there are adaptations which, which can, you know, have a, have a sort of, um, positive feedback loops and, and actually improve the environments but mm. you know, quite you know then it's it's normally not a benign activity just like most things mm. when, we, when we when we do anything in the physical world it does have an effect somewhere on somebody or something so there's always it's always a bit of a sliding scale really that's interesting i think the the air conditioning question is so is going to become so important over the the, the coming decades um, as more and more of you know places like Northern Europe, which have never needed air conditioning, uh, but we're now getting heat waves in the summer that are, you know, very dangerous to live in without you know with our current infrastructure. Um, and you see some of the um, some of the measures that are going on in cities, places like Paris, they're doing uh, cool mm. rooms, so yeah. they're turning public spaces into they just air condition them and they say just you can just come in here and hang out and cool down for a while, um, yeah, which. which is- in in a sense seems more i mean it's better isn't it if you can if you have to use air conditioning at least uh share the air con- share the cool don't you know don't air condition yeah. every building just to have or a sh- public building share, share the cool <laughs> as it's called so as the opposite to warmth cool yeah and it yeah that started in um in seattle i think they first started doing oh uh, really these, these these cool rooms um and it was actually one of the one of the stories which i'd kind of because as i was sort of working with glacier trust and started off i was collecting all these kind of weird and wonderful stories of adaptation that were going on that's one of the ones which mm-hmm. jumped out to me the kind of cool rooms of paris and that sounds quite, kind of quite exotic and interesting and it's probably not at all it's probably just like a, a room in a town hall which uh, yeah. kind of people sat around sat around some table collapsible tables and chairs but um but but as a concept and as a kind of a kind of piloting of, of what we might see in the future, you know, it, it starts off as a kind of a sort of quick change of a, of a like redeploying a room so that you can help mm. people who can't afford to have air conditioning to actually come and be safe together and be communal, share one air conditioned unit. And obviously that has, that has a big safety impact. Um, climate has a good positive climate impact in terms of nowhere near as many sort of mm. machines whirring away, which is good. Um, but, you know, they could develop into, you know, I think pubs were originally in the in England. You know, they pubs were sort of shared sense shared places of warmth. Like people went to the mm. pub to have a drink, but also to gather around the fire and to stay and to stay warm in the winter months. I think probably you know that's that's still true in lots of parts of the world as well. Sort of mm. cafes and that sort of things are are those sort of shared spaces where people can stay warm, but also to stay cool. So it'd be interesting to see if more of those happen. I thought I saw some, some had popped up as well in, in Canada. And then when there was the heat wave in Canada oh, in the yeah. summer as well, they, they, they had some cool rooms set up there as well, which obviously probably more challenging during COVID times as well with social distancing, but it's, um, it was, it was a strategy they went for, but um, yeah, the Paris stuff is really interesting. There's a, there's a great article in the guardian by Megan Clements, who, which I write about in the book, which um, where she tested out all of Paris's different strategies for coping with heat waves. And so, yeah, she went, she heard about these cool rooms and popped in there, but she also sort of um, went to visit the, like the parks and stuff was are staying open 24 hours now in Paris. So uh, people can, yeah. If it's too hot, if it's too hot in their flat, which it will be in lots of people's sort of 
they've got a really sort of south facing flat with which heats up all day so they can go and chill out in the in the park all night if they if they want to or at least go for a walk if it gets too hot um and they have sort of loads more fountains and things like going you know those sort of ones where you can you can walk through and kind of kids can play around in to stay cool and outdoor swimming pools and things like that but she also did some quite you know quite a lot of the ad hoc adaptation which is going on which is sort of you know running into a hotel lo- lobby because you need the air conditioned you know just to just to go there for an orange juice for a bit just to cool off or um and you know even even talked about going into a supermarket and just grabbing a a, a can of fizzy fizzy pop and that's sticking on her face to, yeah. to cool her off and you know these are the sorts of things we do without thinking about it and it's also things like we, we buy one of those silly hand fans like a plastic rubbish which ends up in the landfill in no yeah. time at all and these are the sorts of little instinctual adaptations that people are probably doing without even really thinking about them as climate yeah. adaptations but but they are doing them and like and this is this is the key thing from an environmental and social justice perspective you know the reason one of the reasons we wrote this book was was to sort of say look people are going to adapt in the same way that people travel and there's there's kind of green and socially just ways of traveling and there's green and socially mm. just ways of adapting and actually we have to sort of we have to accept that adaptation is something that is happening and that people are going to do and rather than just ignoring it and kind of thinking oh we just let's not think about adaptation let's just think about mitigation it's you know ignoring it just means that people will continue to do it in these ad hoc ways and kind of in these ways which have these negative externalities and these negative knock-on impacts and and actually, they don't. They don't need to. And with a bit of education and a bit of kind of infrastructure, then you know people can adapt in ways which are either going to either be regenerative or at least be sort of as low impact on on mm. wider issues as possible. And so um, that's kind of the great adaptations are the ones which are thinking about those wider sort of um, knock on consequences of how we're adapting and and um, and looking for ways to do it in 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 more positive ways or less damaging ways at least. It it strikes me that m- maybe um, sometimes looking backwards is a source of 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 inspiration and knowledge for adaptation. And I'm mm-hmm. thinking particularly about, as you said, the sort of Gulf states um, in the Middle East, yeah. which you know Qatar and Dubai, who are like you know putting all this. Obviously, they have a lot of oil wealth, and they're putting a lot of this energy into air, you know modern solutions like air conditioning. Yeah. But of course, they've you know people have been living in in those really hot places for thousands of years and the traditional cities um that were there before dubai and 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 the rest sprung up were um made of local materials um that were very insulating so they would keep the heat out Mm -hmm. and they would keep the indoors cool they the urban form was very tight narrow streets that would basically always be in shade so they would be cool and they even had devices like uh, wind towers where they'd have a higher building um uh, sort of at the head of a street and that would direct air down and you get a breeze rolling through the street. Yeah, amazing, yeah. Yeah, and so they figured all this out, you know, 5,000 years ago. But the modern um, aspiration for those places is North American style skyscrapers and highways and big open spaces that are, you know, the, the absolute opposite of what you would do if you were thinking about how do we live in this climate, you know, this place yeah. uh, naturally. Uh, and so they've sort of they've they've sort of screwed themselves because the, the urban form that they've built is so not conducive to like natural low carbon adaptation. Yeah, for sure. And you know the the car is king, isn't it? And and yeah. the car is a big part of that, isn't it? In terms of those wide streets, and and this is why kind of you know the electric vehicle revolution and this this idea that if we all switch to electric vehicles, then everything will be fine. Um, doesn't address these these issues, and you know those. Like you say that, yeah, some of those um, examples from the past and those those ways of living and those those ways of building are far more sustainable ultimately, aren't they? And, the, yeah. and, and like you say, it's local materials as well, so it's even cutting down the impact in terms of building it yeah. as well. So um, it makes me think of I went to um, to Fez in Morocco and the, the the bazaar there in Fez, which is just absolutely amazing, which is exactly mm-hmm. like that. It's a kind of very narrow streets. You know, cars can't get through them and. You get mopeds like nearly knocking you over as you walk along. But, <laughs> but um, it was, yeah, it was, it was noticeably so much more pleasant, even though it was kind of dark and a bit sort of bit edgy, you know. But it was, <laughs> but actually, like you really noticed if you stepped out of that and went into the kind of modern part of the city, 
the difference in, was it was huge right. in terms of like the the environment and how it felt to be there. So um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see if that if that returns in some way as we get more and more kind of cities are becoming more interested, aren't they, in being in being mm. having huge car free zones, mm. and so it might be that it becomes they become conducive to this kind of higher density and 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 that sort of those kind of yeah low carbon cooling strategies it'll be interesting to see if that if that emerges um and i imagine if it does it'll it'll emerge in in the middle east and northern africa and um, those parts of the world first and another one that sort of springs to mind is you know in every um house in the south of france or in spain or italy has shutters on the outside mm. of, of the windows and so they just keep them closed during the summer and it, it is very effective at keeping you know the the indoor is cool to to a degree obviously once you get into like the upper 30s degrees it's yeah. it, you know that's when you start to need air conditioning that kind of thing but it does strike me as that seems like such a straightforward solution in britain um yeah it's just a, it's just to bolt on some shutters outside your you know on particular windows and just keep them closed during the day during the summer but I yeah i'd love to see um Kevin McLeod and do a grand designs on this sort of stuff. But like, <laughs> it, I guess it, it'll happen soon. I'm sure. Actually, they did have an episode relatively recently about a guy who was building a house um, down in the, on the Thames estuary somewhere, and he was building it on stilts to oh, account yeah. for the flooding, um, which was pretty amazing. But you know, it'd be, it'd be be fantastic if we saw more examples of that. Seeing you know, we're having these retractable shadings to help to help to cope with the heat waves and. And yeah, some of the flood defences that they might put in, which are more nature-based and drainage systems, which are which aren't sort of, you know, we have more permeable um, surfaces rather than yeah. kind of all channeling it into one into one culvert. So uh, it'll be interesting to see if that kind of starts to take off. But I think yeah, at the moment the kind of the taste, the fashions around architecture mm. aren't really conducive to uh, either mitigating climate change or, or adapting to it. It seems to me, but you're probably far more of a an expert on on what the trends are and um, what might happen. but Yeah, well, I think I think new developments often get a lot of things right in terms of sustainable drainage systems um, and that kind of thing. Well, I guess the trouble is what, what you do with the rest of the city that's already built out, where which mm. is actually having, you know, having the problems with flooding and heat waves. Um, and it seems to be there's less of a mechanism for actually retrofitting adaptation measures on. Um, because yeah. if you have a new development, there's a developer with a lot of money who you can tell them you need to put in these measures, you know, and 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 they'll hopefully pay for it. Um, but if you're yeah. a local council who's really, you know, strapped for cash and, you know, they don't necessarily have a lot of money to uh, to start retrofitting streets and buildings all over the place. No, so in, in, in Greater Manche- Manchester at the moment, there's a research and kind of piloting effort going on called Ignition where they're looking at um, how to, yeah, put these sustainable drainage system in these suds as a, as a kind of acronym down to yeah um trying to work out how to use green spaces and trying to they're trying to map out what the green spaces are work out how each one of those could have a sustainable drainage system so that you know so the effects of flash flooding could be lessened and so there's less mm. runoff and all this all this stuff but they're also trying to work out how to finance it and and like how mm. to create business models around like to create the business case for installing that type of drainage system rather than a kind of gray infrastructure so mm. kind of get this green infrastructure in which i think from reading um some of the reports and stuff coming out of that project they're they're struggling to find the the business case ways to, to do <laughs> this at the moment and it's kind of you know will it may be something you know in the end that the market isn't going to solve and we have to find yeah. that these things do need to be subsidized and we do we do need state actors to actually step in and say look we need to we need to build it this way, otherwise it's going to have all this collateral damage downstream. I mean, you know, the people who are the people who are going to get damaged by the existing infrastructure aren't going to have the money to pay people to prevent that damage. That's so yeah. hard to achieve politically, but um, it's it's more possible. I think um, I think it'd be, it'd be interesting how how that the conclusions to that pilot. Mm-hmm. I think it wraps up in April twenty twenty two, and it'll be interesting to see what they. Um, what the final conclusions are from it in terms of the way forward. Um, um, but yeah, it's um, it's hard to see how they're going to create the business case for it myself, which is a shame. Um, you, you mentioned um, a couple of your, uh, a little bit on your work that you're doing in Nepal with um, the Glacier Trust. Mm-hmm. Um, do you want to tell us a bit, bit more about that, about some of the projects you're doing over there? 
Yeah, it'd be great. Um, so Nepal is obviously a very mountainous country, but <laughs> the most probably mm-hmm. the most mountainous in the world. Um, but it has a, a huge range of geography. Sort of the south of Nepal is is kind of the very northern tip of the of the Great Gangetic Plain, which is in northern India, and so it's actually really quite close to sea level. So they have quite serious heat wave issues there and flooding issues there. But then once you get into the kind of foothills of the Himalayas, which which kind of go up in stages, um, where lots of traditional um, farms and stuff exist, these kind of terraced farming, which, which you can probably seen pictures of if you're not mm. visited, but it's um, these these incredible sort of, you know, there'd be a hundred terraces, which are all six foot apart, sort of in height, and about six foot wide, which step all the way up the mountain, which are a nightmare to climb, by the way, which I have to do <laughs> quite often. <laughs> it just really tests my, uh, my, my urban urban lifestyle um, <laughs> they are um but those places are they're suffering you know lots of impacts of globalization already you know people are there's a lot of out migration from nepal um young mostly men um emigrating to middle east and southeast asia and everywhere really to, to find to find work and send money back so there's, there's those challenges going on nepal is kind of in between india and china like two huge superpowers who are kind of always fighting over it and there's all you know, sort of those influences are, are really strong. And yeah, it's, it's, it's a classic sort of story of a lot of asset stripping happens there. Sort of any raw materials that they have get get sort of exported before they have any value added to them. So Nepal doesn't make a whole lot of money. And what it does make its money out of is, is tourism, um, mountaineering, and all, all this sort of stuff is is very important to the to the economy. But, but the, at the domestic level, the economy is really based around agriculture and and all the kind of newspapers, whenever I visit, they, you know, it's agricultural news nearly, all, mm. all of the newspaper, which is, which you don't get here. Um, but it's interesting, like the price of something has changed or um, there's been an outbreak of some pest in some part of, part of the country. That's the sort mm. of stuff which comes up in the news. Um, so in the mountain communities where we work, there's um, all these sort of pressures exist already, these, these out-migration pressures, and, and then climate change is just further exacerbating these because it's making it harder to... To kind of subsist in 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 uh, through agriculture through sort of a real traditional subsistence agriculture is becoming harder because of the labor force dropping and then climate change is coming in and sort of um like playing havoc really with the monsoon season is the mm-hmm. kind of the main thing that happens so they and instead of the monsoon kind of being quite predictable and having sort of predictable rain within it um it's it's kind of starting at the at the, at the wrong time or too late or too early um, and then it's kind of false starting and then then going back to like dry for like three weeks oh, again. Right. So so farmers will plant some crops and then it, then it won't rain and then, and then those crops will die and then you'll have to start again. And sometimes they can't afford to start again. Wow. Um, and so there's there's and then if it does rain, they tend to get this like an absolute deluge of rain, which which causes flash floods, landslides, the roads get blocked, you know, people's houses get destroyed by by rockfall and all, all this awful stuff can happen and so um i mentioned before about sort of insect pests coming up like for higher and higher up the mountain and attacking plants they'd never been to and the farmers encountering these insects for the first time like for, mm. you, know, you know generations have never seen them before and suddenly they've arrived in the in parasites on the plants and all this stuff and so there's lots of stuff which needs to be adapted to which um which is you know why the glacier trust was established in the first place and so we work with um two local NGOs they're both sort of Nepal based and and work um directly in the communities and so we we work you know they design the projects we we have a little bit of say but not very much at all and we'll and Mm. then we we kind of go away and try and raise the funds to to actually make these projects happen and so um that's that's kind of a big part of my role really is to is to try and raise those funds and um we the big thing we've had success with is um the to develop um what's called an agroforestry resource center which is Mm. agroforestry is effectively the farming of trees so switching from just farming kind of rice and millet and maize and kind of those traditional crops to actually starting to sort of farm trees in in this things like fruit trees um but also um nuts and we're also growing coffee as well and there's lots of this kind of layer farming going on where you Mm. where you can grow a banana tree which shades a coffee um, bush 
which which then has a root vegetable growing underneath it's all on one plot of land you've got these three different crops happening brilliant um, and that's that's a kind of adaptation strategy because they can those crops can be grown in ways which um which you know help to fight against the insects like planting the right crop next to another crop helps to helps to defend one crop from another which is pretty cool to to see when they when they make that happen Mm -hmm. um but also it creates kind of shaded areas as well which means that the the kind of the you know they're they're, you know for one thing they're sucking in carbon dioxide which is obviously a good good news for climate change but they're also creating a kind of microclimates which are quite cool for people to exist in and good for wildlife and good for nature as well so um that's that's going on so these agroforestry resource centers are um kind of community hubs they're a physical building where um farmers from increasingly they come from quite far around and they'll they'll walk they'll trek in and then then they'll go to these centers where they'll um have workshops and some of the some of the workshops are theory based and actually like learn about why different why you know learn about a crop and it's actually its biology and how it and how it works and how to plant it and they'll show videos and stuff of people growing it and the, and the success and they'll, they'll also learn about how to how to sell the crop how to market it and how to mm. get it to market so as they get support with that um, but then there's also loads of demonstration plots at these um, oh, yeah. centers as well. So they'll so they'll actually go and have a go at um, digging um, the hole to put um, a tree in. But but to do it, right, it's not just dig a hole and put stick a stick a tree in. It's this biointensive method of planting, which involves digging a hole which is a meter deep and meter wide, and then putting layers of like ash and um, oh, wow. green vegetation, sort of dried dried leaves. Um, manure and stuff and and like there's a really scientific way of planting these Mm. trees to make to give them the best chance which is really quite scientific actually and like you're in you're in in a very kind of um traditional community where um you wouldn't expect this kind of like really quite precise sort of engineering really going on and i'm always amazed by how how accurate they'll they'll do things like how accurately they'll space out where they plant the trees they'll they'll measure it you know to the to the centimeters saying oh we need to need to be a little bit further and and that sort mm-hmm. of stuff which is really interesting and and so they're learning at these agroforestry centers they're set up to help people to learn how to how to adopt these different forms of agriculture and to practice them and then they can also th- those centers then also grow the kind of um seedlings of like the coffee plants or the avocado plant um which the farmers can then take home to plant in their own on their own farms um so it's kind of a garden center which has training it would be a really kind of uk <laughs> way to think about it um but it's community led and and the you know any any profit they they raise they they use it to sort of further the education and they kind of expand and have these sort of satellite plant nurseries around the community as well so that farmers don't have to trek you know two hours up a massive mountain to, mm. to get to this the main center they can go to a, a local one to get the seedlings and stuff they need and those and then those local ones are also because they're at different altitude and have slightly different geography and di- different sort of conditions there are also other great places to kind of test out could we grow this crop here now because of climate change or yeah is this the lower limit or the upper limit for coffee and and, and they they're actually using these satellites to sort of work out um what's possible so it's um yeah it's really exciting and it's and we've set one up in dosa in salakumbu which is about 40 kilometers due south of mount everest or Sagamatha is, is called in Nepal. Um, and that one was set up in 20, sort of started in 2013, survived the earthquakes that happened in 2015, mm. and now is totally thriving. And there's the local sort of local authority there is trying to replicate it in the next valley along, the next valley along, which is great. And then building on the success of that, we've, we've managed to fund another one, which has been running for three years in Cavre, which is closer to Kathmandu, the capital, and at a slower, slightly lower altitude. So we're, we've got two of them happening at the moment. And there's, there's a third one being built um, through our partner, Eco Mal. I've got funding from somewhere else to build another one. So it's, um, it's a model that's really working. It's quite exciting. And I think it's a model which could work in the UK as well, I think. Um, mm. And I've just written an article for Permaculture Magazine, which um, is coming out early 2022, where I'm talking about this and the possibility of, you know, could some of our garden centres, rather than being sort of pure sort of commercial operations, which is selling people ornamental flowers and not much else, and not re- and sort of not really training people in how to garden, mm. how to, how to be climate resilient, and how to adapt to climate change, could they become centres for us to actually learn ways to to grow and and um, 
different crops and, and to be more adaptive and to, and to grow yeah. own food and all this stuff. I mean, some garden centers are doing this, but there's probably not enough of it happening and there, and there could be a lot more of it. And I think it's, um, it's a great opportunity for, um, you know, climate change is hitting the poorest and the most vulnerable first and they tend to be in the global South. They're working out ways to adapt. I mean, Bangladesh does not suffer anywhere near as much as Europe suffers when it gets hit by a flash flood because they know how to adapt to it. They know how to wow. have early warning systems in place to, to stop people from, you know, being flooded out of their homes and 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 killed by by flooding um, because they've experienced it more and they've set up strategies to kind of cope with this stuff and you know the knowledge transfer from the global south to the global north needs to happen and this yeah to, to see you know it's it is possible to adapt in in ways which can also be part of a broader transformative process. Wow, I, I love that. That's such a great example. I mean, I think there's like well, just thinking on the. the point you made last i think there is sometimes a an arrogance that we think we can't learn anything from from the global south and that we're the ones that should be teaching them but obviously you know it's clearly not the case but i suppose from your point of view how important is it that these <clears throat> these adaptation um projects are community led rather than you know like top down government led or does it just depend yeah i mean i think the thing which I find with adaptation, this is one of the struggles with it, I think, in terms of getting it onto the agenda um, at national and international levels, is that it's rarely there's rarely one size fits all when it comes mm. to adaptation. Like the conditions, like environmentally, atmospherically, politically, socially, vary so much in different parts of the world, and you know within within countries as well. So. It's very so the adaptation strategies that need to be adopted are, you know, they need they can't just be sort of bolted on and just sort of here you go stick these shutters on your windows and everything will be fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's um it needs to there needs to be a lot more planning and 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 leadership and, and bottom up leadership. And the other the other part of that is that if the communities themselves are involved and are actually looking for ways to adapt and actually designing those adaptations themselves then if it does involve bringing in a new technology or, or a new kind of way of living or way of working, they are going to be, you know, if they've come up with it, then they'll, then they'll do it rather than if it's imposed yeah. upon them as kind of here's the solution in it. It'll only cost you this much money and you can pay it off over 10 years and <laughs> at this rate of interest, <laughs> which is the danger, then um, then they're far more likely to, to actually, for it to be effective. Um, so I think, yeah, bottom up is 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 definitely key to it and it's you know the the work that we do in nepal is very much that community-led approach so we um you know eco himalaya are one of our partners they'll you know they, they'll when they employ a project officer they employ them from the from the location so they're already embedded in the community and they know people they know what the environment's like and yeah. they've you know they've maybe been away to to university to get some some expertise in, in agriculture and some specialisms but you know they they know where they're working and who they're working with. And then, then the, the agroforestry resource centers, you know, have a, have a governing board, which is made up of as far as possible, gender equal board of local people who are actually helping to, who, who know, who know what will work, um, both kind of in a physical sense as, as farmers, you know, but they, but they also know what will, what will, what will work culturally, which is, which is just so, so important to, to any successful, anything really but adaptation mm-hmm. strategies for sure brilliant one of one of the most interesting parts of your book for me anyway was the um discussion around um deep adaptation and transformational adaptation um which was something i hadn't i think i'd heard the terms before but i didn't really know what they meant and you explained it very well um can you take us through what those what that means yeah i'll try um i think um there's kind of two worlds, I think, in terms of two 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 worlds that we can imagine. There's there's kind of a world in which global heating gets to a level of somewhere between one point five and two degrees, and we can make adaptations within that, but carry on kind of you know life as we know it will kind of carry on as is with with a few tweaks. Um, there's that kind of you know story of it, of things getting worse, but then gradually getting better as we start as we mm. start to kind of actually bring temperatures down again which is possible if we stop burning fossil fuels um eventually not in our lifetime but you know in in a century's time potentially so there's that kind of those adaptations so lots of the stuff we've been 
discussing already are kind of within that sort of scenario. But we know from looking at what's happening scientifically with, with climate change, how fast it's progressing, you know, quite often, how many times we hear stories that things are happening more often, like sooner than we thought they were going to happen yeah. in terms of like ice sheets melting and different weather patterns showing up. And so there's that, there's the kind of politics around it and the kind of, you know, the, the just the glacial speed at which climate change politics happens and you know, just had COP26 and, you know, there was yet more incrementalism and it's, yeah. it's, it's um, very slow to change. And then, yeah, so it's, so with those things, it's like the prospects of staying below two degrees and within that kind of getting worse than getting better scenario are, um, stre- you know, we're getting to a point where that might not happen. And so there's a whole sort of other part of the imagination is that if we go past two degrees up to three degrees, four degrees of warming, then suddenly things are, you know, we can't adapt to, to that level of warming. Like you get beyond sort of two or three degrees and it just becomes impossible to, it doesn't matter what crop you try and grow, it won't grow. <laughs> it's like there aren't any crops left that can grow now at that temperature or we can't defend this against, the, against sea level rise anymore. It's go, it's going to flood. We're going to have to retreat. And so there's the potential for these collapses happening. So in that kind of, th- that sort of thinking, which is quite apocalyptic and quite hard to get your head around and quite emotional and like it can it can be quite hard to accept and we can deny that for sure. Um, but there's a growing kind of um, research area and sort of just debate and discussion around, you know, what happens if things do get really bad. And so in 2018, um, Jem Bendel from um, Cumbria, I think university, um, he wrote a, a paper which is called deep adaptation, um, which he self published as a PDF because no journal articles would take it. Um, <laughs> but he'd gone basically gone through all the science of climate change. He was he was a sustainability consultant and sort of spent his career looking and like advising companies and things on how to adapt and how to how to you know slow down their environmental impacts. Um, but he sort of delved into the into the science again. Sort of took a few months off, de- delved into the science and just realized how how like bad the situation was, and sort of decided you know from his point of view he got to, he got to the conclusion that near-term sort of societal collapse is imminent and you know by near-term he means sort of within decades we're going to see serious collapse of food systems which will then cause societal collapses and economic collapses and all of that and so it's really a bleak thing to read and to contemplate um and the kind of i don't think he ever sort of says that we should give up on mitigation though he's kind of accused of that quite often but it's, it's to say, look, we need to really, really accept that things are going to get really bad um, if, you know, if the UN process and whatever fails, which he kind of feels like it's going to, um, things are going to get really, really desperate. And we're going to have to work out ways of sort of letting go of previous ways of living and trying to find ways of living within this radically altered collapsed world so it's quite a heavy thing to to read and it's been it's been controversial and he's had a lot of pushback um and one of the things which has sprung out of it um one of his colleagues um rupert reed who who i know and have have worked with um in different capacities over the years um he kind of as an antidote to that because it is quite bleak and it's quite doomy and you know get people get doomism and rightly so in some cases um actually talking about transformative adaptation as a kind of uh, slightly nicer spin on deep adaptation. So it's actually not giving up. It's thinking about, look, if societies are going to collapse, we need to adapt to the impacts of climate change and the, and the breakdown of ecology as well and our ecological systems. We need to adapt to that stuff, but we need to adapt in ways which are transformative. And actually, can we can we create a society which has much better social justice principles, more equality, less sort of um, obsession over economic growth and actually more steady state economic models or um, and all this stuff and how can we how can we um, sort of not accept the collapse and then just deal with it but actually get ahead of that collapse and transform society before the collapse happens and actually can we decentralize can we have more rural communities which aren't so dependent on sort of fossil fuel use and like and globalization and are we going to see this kind of um move towards societies which are more democratic have citizens assemblies and things like that um and so i talk in the book about um rahava in um 
northern Syria, which is the Kurdish part of northern Syria, um, where, you know, in the wake of the collapse which they've experienced through the civil war, have actually used that as an opportunity to say, right, we're not just going to have a monoculture of olives, which is what which is what they were being forced to grow by Damascus under the kind of Assad regime. They kind of gained some autonomy with the with the kind of um the power vacuum that that resulted from from the civil war. And they have actually, you know, they've actually done a they call it a make Rahava green um make Rahava green again kind of movement, which is a bit of a kind of make America great again sort of sort of spin. Um but in that they've they've started to to you know it's an eco feminist decentralized model of, of living is kind of and it's sort of inspired by Murray Bookchin and, and his and his work around and ideas around that about sort of anarchist thinking and sort of radical democracy where people are far more involved in the decision making which affects them and decisions are made at the level of uh, w- which it's sensible to make the decision and, um, and that's what's emerged and so and it's kind of an example of transformative adaptation happening and it might be one that it won't be directly replicable because like i said before geographies and environments are different in every part of the world but it's relative that they're, they're despite still being in the middle of a civil war they're, they're making it happen making it work and it might be that it can transfer to other parts of the world so you, know, you see sort of examples of this happening you know even in gaza um in palestine this sort of stuff is is happening in below the radar and like not really being talked about but it's, but it's there and it exists and and um these are the things which you know these are kind of examples of this transformative adaptation that are happening which if we do you know whether or not temperatures go above two degrees and up to three degrees it's there's still a lot of sense in making these transitions anyway because those lives are you know although they'll be materially simpler they might it doesn't mean that well-being outcomes won't be you know better or or at least as good as today for for a lot of people. So it's um, it's a really interesting to see that movement. But the yeah the transformative adaptation is far more I lean towards than the kind of deep adaptation, which because the transformative stuff is actually you know it's still showing that you know things are still possible and that life can still go go on. And whereas the deep adaptation can get a little bit into the kind of extinction of all human species kind of territory quite quickly, which is um, yeah which we can wallow in and not end up not taking any action. So. Um, far more interested in the transformative stuff. That's 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 brilliant. I mean, I think there's thanks for you know going through that for us, and I think it's for me it's opened up a whole world of of thinking about these things in in a deeper way. So I'm definitely like on the down the rabbit hole now, just like doing more reading and trying <laughs> to figure figure these things out. I did I did discover uh, on Reddit there's a sub there's a subreddit community called uh, Collapse, and it's all just people who are convinced that the world is about to end like showing off their yeah. bunkers and their food supplies yeah. and all this kind of stuff and it's a, it's it's a deeply like um bizarre place to visit if you're not yeah. sort of in that world but there are a lot of people who are like convinced that the, the, you know the end is nigh um and then you look yeah. out the window and you know the world keeps keeps turning business goes on as usual and you just think well, like it's so hard to know what there's what always been happening. you know there's always been prophets of doom um, yeah you know, going back to thomas malthus but um and then you know th- that is one strategy or one response to climate change is right i'm going to build a bunker and i'm going to be safe uh, but it's just uh you know or, or a lifeboat like a, a metaphorical yeah. lifeboat or an actual lifeboat there's a there's actually something called seasteading which is some which is a company that's proposing to basically build a community on the sea like oh, a bit God. sort of you know, Kevin Costner Waterworld. Style. <laughs> is that what it's called? I'm not sure. I'll have to check that. But um Yeah, which is quite bizarre, but it's um but yeah, it, it exists. But I think there's far more people who are kind of you know, most people are cooperative and, and want um, you know, human species is successful because it's cooperative and yeah. collaborative and compassionate and you know, that's most of us. And yeah, you're gonna get people at the extremes who are just prepping for the for the for doom and trying to you know, loading up their guns to survive, but I think it's it's a minority. It might feel like a lot, but yeah. it's it's a minority. And I think um, actually, there's far more people who are actually looking for ways to yeah to transform our societal structures, our economic structures, and our and our relationship to the environment, so that, so that we can kind of come out of this crisis that we're in to live you know better lives. You know, I've I've just had a sunny seven months old, and like 
the idea that he'll be living in the next century. What will the world be like? Um, mm. It won't be like it is. You know, changes happen. Change is going to come, isn't it? But it's um, this is the Naomi, Naomi Klein quote of you know, it's change or be changed, and mm. you know, we're either going to be changed by climate change and let it hit us, or we're going to change so that we can move beyond it and kind of trans yeah. transform into something else. So that's the um, that's the hope. Eh? Um, I'll bring us on to our final question, um, which is the same question I always ask guests, um, which is from your perspective, what needs to happen over the next decade um, to ensure successful action on climate change and whatever, you know, you can define for yourself what, what you think success would look like. Mm, yeah, I think success is definitely a relative <laughs> term, isn't it? At this, <laughs> at this stage, I think um, climate change is already, um, yeah, been Not really with catastrophic for, for a lot of people and mm. cause a lot of damage um so it's so yeah success for me is is going to be about um yeah transitioning away from the reliance on fossil fuels and from the sort of obsession with gdp growth which seems to be dominating mm. our politics um so i think in terms of what needs to happen in the next decade it's it is it is that it's kind of um a societal wide kind of um, commitment, I guess, to to being transformatist. Mm. And by that, I kind of mean at the moment, it's quite easy to kind of live your life in a kind of um, accepting your portion in life and kind of just going let, letting letting the kind of powers that be continue to control things and just sort of in a kind of individualistic way, just think, right, I just need to get by. I need to sort of, you know, these big things are too much for me to deal with. It's I'll, I'll just focus on me and my family and and keeping our lives on track and making the best of it as we possibly can. And actually, if 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 we continue in that in that mindset, um, then things aren't going to change. And actually, mm. we are going to be changed either by the physical changes that's happening in the world or by um, authoritarian politicians who are going to use the climate crisis like they use the COVID crisis to actually start to kind of um do yeah some quite authoritative things which which you know could have really terrible consequences of society mm. so i really hope to see that more people are going to um take it upon themselves to organize into, into groups to to think about you know what's really important is the is the is pursuing economic growth both as a nation and as an indiv individual and this kind of idea the material wealth equals happiness um mm -hmm. you know and actually to start to let go of that stuff and actually start to think about what real well-being is about um and to start measuring some of those those things that matter a lot more than sort of just how much pound and pence you've got in the bank and actually and be part of a movement to try and transform the way we think about life and actually in our, in our relationships with with each other and with and with the planet and so that we can create a more socially just world so i think it's a real kind of transformative process within individuals which can lead to transformative mm. process at the societal level because i don't think it's possible to kind of continue with this consumer capitalist model and have climate stability those those two things are incompatible i think it's becoming abundantly clear to a lot of people that we can't have kind of this excessive consumerism and and a stable climate and actually we need to sort of let go of consumerism not just because it's terrible for the planet but also because it's not that great for us either yeah <laughs> yeah so, exactly. it sells us a lot of false hope and a lot of false promises breaks those promises and makes us buy something again to make ourselves feel better again it's a it's this awful kind of hedonic treadmill it's called um and getting off that i think um i have a lot of hope that there's you know, as a society, we, we have, you know, we corporate, cooperate a lot and we have a lot of compassion. Those are our shared values. And actually, if we start to see that um, in society and that a lot of people want to create change, then a lot of change is possible. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. That was, that was, uh, that was a good answer. It was a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was a bit waffling, um, but um, it's, uh, yeah, there's, it's a big decade. It's, it's a huge, huge decade. So in, you know, in, a global action plan in my other job you know our, our education strategy is is based around how can we nurture young people's both ability but also their inclination to transform our world because mm. you know it's it's fairly easy to give people the, the the ability to change things but whether they're inclined to do it whether they have mm. the motivation to do it and the confidence to do it 
is a different thing and that's that's where we need to have that kind of transformation of our kind of world views and values and beliefs they need to shift and and um that's what for me is what needs to happen in the next decade and we want all young people to leave school in 2030 with this kind of ability and inclination to transform the world Wow. Well, we, we we could talk do another whole podcast, I think, on that topic alone. <laughs> that just sounds <laughs> fascinating. But I, I'll uh, I'll I'll wrap up wrap things up now. Um, thank you so much for coming on. It's it's been really really good. Um, where can people find out more about you online? Um, well, the Glacier Trust is at theglaciertrust.org, um, and we're on Twitter at, at the Glacier Trust, um, and the same on Instagram. Um, Global Action Plan is globalactionplan.org.uk. Um, and that that is at global act plan on twitter um and then me personally i'm at morgan h phillips on okay. um, on this twitter is probably where i'm mostly at in terms of social medias and yeah i'm very happy to carry on the conversation with anybody who wants to discuss these things a bit more and um yeah the book is great adaptations in the shadow of a climate crisis and um you can get it from the glacier trust website but it's also on all of the kind of online bookstores some Sure. less evil than others so choose wisely <laughs> excellent thanks I'll, pu- I'll put links to everything in the podcast description so people can just go find them there um, but yeah thank you very much brilliant thanks Ross yeah really appreciate it it's great great to meet you and to chat through these things <laughs>